Well, welcome to Family Talk, the broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh. Now, here's something to think about. Since the turn of the century, technological innovation and social media have profoundly changed our world. You can stay connected with loved ones or learn about current events right from your smartphone anywhere you are. But you know, many of us have become so immersed in our fast-paced digital world that we really don't know how to unplug and just relax anymore. Well, on today's edition of Family Talk, we're going to hear from our guest, John Eldridge, and his response to this increasing issue. John is a best-selling author, a speaker, a lecturer, and counselor. He's also president of Wild at Heart Ministries. And now, let's join John Eldridge and our own Dr. James Dobson on this classic edition of Family Talk. How, in what way, has the world gone mad? We're spending four to nine hours a day on our mobile devices, three hours a day Using our apps, we are consuming 10 hours a day of media. That's enough data in one week to crash a laptop. It's the pace of life. It's the tsunami of media coming at us. And then you, in the midst of that madness, you have what was in the New Testament. They go back to Lot and they say he was tormented in his righteous soul by all that he saw happening around him. Another translation says vexed. Yes. He was vexed yes. in his righteous soul. Have you ever been vexed? Uh, frequently. That's different than being angry. Yeah. It just means frustrated to your ears. Yeah, that's right. All of that collectively. So the, the basic premise of the book is this. To, to survive an hour like the one we live in, You have to have a life that's just saturated with God. But the hour we live in is perfectly designed to keep you from having that life because of the distraction and the cell phones and the media and, right? Television, cable, computers, my goodness. My goodness. Here's where it began for me. I'm a grandfather now Hmm. and loving it. But I found myself trying to play with my grandchildren and being distracted. I could, I could give them my attention for about five minutes. And then I wanted to check my phone. I wanted to check the news. I wanted to see what was going on. I was a distracted grandfather, and I didn't like it. And I started looking at all of my other habits and realized, oh, my goodness, somewhere along the way, I got trapped in this madness that I came to like it. I like the distraction. You said that uh, distraction is something we get obsessed with. Yeah, we do for two reasons. One, because of all the stuff that comes, you know, into your inbox every week, this fantastic video of, you know, this person jumping off a building or this amazing thing, it gets your attention. But also because the distraction keeps us from facing our lives. We'd rather be distracted than spend 10 minutes quiet with ourselves because we don't like what we find there. So we go back to the distraction. What do we find there? Anger, depression, cynicism, fear, anxiety, right? The the whole panoply of human brokenness is right there. And I just realized instead of looking to God in a moment of quiet, one moment of quiet, I'm talking 30 seconds, I'd grab my phone again. And it was was Nicholas Carr's book. He almost won the Pulitzer Prize for this book. It's called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And Carr did this immense amount. Physiologically? Physiological changing the structure of the human brain to shorten our attention span, among other things, and get us addicted to the dopamine cycle of seeking, you know, the next thing on whose Facebook post of their cat, you know, reading a book while sitting on the toilet or some silly thing like that. And we're absolutely captured by it. We are unable to get out of the madness because it's literally changing the way human beings think and our ability to pay attention to things, which was what was happening to me with my grandkids. John, when I was at Focus on the Family a number of years ago, 
the director or president of the organization called Mm -hmm. K-Love came to see me. We sat and talked, and he said, our audience will not hold still for a speaker. And there is only one speaker out there that they will listen to, and it's you for five minutes. Right. Five minutes. How sad that I can't talk for 30 minutes about an intellectual subject or teach anything. Mm-hmm. And here, It's not just a cultural crisis. It's a spiritual crisis because down through the ages, serious followers of Christ have believed that true discipleship and real transformation of our lives requires being able to give God our attention. And if we can't listen to a speaker for more than five minutes, you're going to have a really hard time praying, Well, it for explains example. why churches are diminishing in, in the number of people that come. And, and how the pressure on churches, by the way, to put on amazing yeah. services. Yeah. Entertain. Oh, you have to have a worship thing going on that rivals, you know, uh, professional musicians. I mean, the, the pastor has to be brilliant or he doesn't have a chance. It's a spiritual crisis at its root, and I just want to help folks learn some very simple ways to get out of the madness. At the beginning of the program we did yesterday, I thought we were going to be talking about this book, and we talked about Wild at Heart, Um, but I started it by quoting a very familiar verse, Mm -hmm. Psalm 4610, which instructs us to be still and know that I am God. Mm. Boy, if there's anything that contradicts the American or the worldwide phenomenon of busy, busy, frantic Mm -hmm. lifestyles, Mm -hmm. that's it. Yes. People can't hold still long enough to listen to the voice of God. Mm -hmm. And I want to admit to you it's a problem for me too because I'm trapped in the same culture right? to some degree. Yeah, and it's coming into our phones and into our inbox every hour, the distractions there. But here's the beautiful thing, the research that's coming out now that shows if you will be still for even a few moments— The cortisol levels in your body go down. You actually do begin to quiet down. It heals the frenetic brain. That way of life, if you'll just do that once a day, be still before God, it will heal your soul. Let's go back to what you said about the brain. How is the human brain affected by all this noise. For years, brain researchers thought the human brain was a fairly um, fixed reality, that after childhood, you know, the, it's, it's immensely pliable in childhood. But the previous consensus was after childhood, it's a fairly fixed system. The good news is it's not. It's immensely pliable through most of your life. You are absolutely accurate on that. I've read the same research. Right. The hopefulness on that has to do with uh, healing trauma and also healing addictive behaviors because the brain can learn new ways. It actually forms new connections, and you can get out of those things. So the way the Internet works, the way people— use their cell phones, is training the brain to only pay attention for very short periods of time without something new being presented to it. How does one go about getting out of this mad, 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 mad world we live in? Chapter one, I set the bar very low. It's called the one-minute pause because I want people to realize it's accessible, it's doable, and we're teaching people to pause a couple of times a day, maybe when you, you know, pull into work in the morning before you walk in the door, maybe when you get home at night, you know, pause. And we're teaching people 1 Peter 5 where it says, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. Learning to turn it all over to the Lord. It, the Desert Fathers called it benevolent detachment. So for, I can do it for 60 seconds. That's all <laughs> I'm asking, okay? 60 seconds, you pause, you give Christ your attention, and you say, Jesus, I give all the madness to you. For right now, I release it to you. 
you know, my field is child development, and uh, I am very interested in how you protect kids from the madness that you're talking about. Okay. If you watch um, videos for children, uh, cartoons included, it is flash, flash, flash. We're teaching children to be addicted to that kind of speed. Exactly. So here's the fun answer. The answer for kids is the same as adults, by the way. It is nature. Get outside. Your soul was literally, including your brain, was designed to live in the world God created. And things like sunlight, okay, and the actual sounds of nature, birds chirping, you know, uh, stream, rain, snowfall, you know. Um, Wind. Yes. That is what heals the human soul. The big request is get kids back outside. The World Health Organization announced 10 years ago now. So you know it's worse. We spend 93% of our lives indoors, including childhood. So that if you live to be 100, you will have spent 93 of those years. And most of them in an urban environment yes. uh, where they don't get outside. Uh, last weekend, I told you I had a chance to go to Texas. I yes. was on a ranch there. Man, I experienced what you're talking about, just being there. I was there. From, Shirley and I were there for four days, and I absolutely loved it. Yes. That, because there was something healing about it. Isn't it? But most people don't have a chance to do that. But even uh, the research shows even a 20-minute walk outside lowers the cortisol levels in your body. I work in an office building. But what I do is I go outside every day and walk around the building. I just take a walk outside. Pay attention to what the weather's doing. You know, let the wind kiss your cheek. Like one of the rescues is in the world God made. Nature heals the human soul. Cortisol is the hormone that uh, affects the brain and puts you on an alarm reaction state. Yes. You're not able to relax when you're under the pressure of that hormone. Yes. Uh, you're telling me that just being outside reduces that level. It does significantly. Hormonal activity. So does pausing. So does practicing the psalm that you read, just being still. Our whole world right now triggers the fight or flight mechanism all day long. It's just that it's got everybody on yeah. hypervigilance. Well, we can make choices to get out of that. We're not locked up. We're not in concentration camps. We could actually make choices about this madness, and you can get your life back really rather easily. One of them that I've done very successfully is I have refused to text. I'm the only person I know that will not do it. I see people, you know, clinking away on their cell phones, texting each other. It's slow. And it absorbs them. Mm, I mean, mm. it absolutely absorbs them. Mm, mm. And I just will not do it. I've got big hands. I don't like to hit keys anyway. So I just decided I'm not going there. It makes people, it frustrates people because they try to get to me that way. And I don't even know that they have texted me. But C.S. Lewis also considered himself to be a dinosaur. And he was a man who changed his time. So you hold fast to that. <laughs> Hold now fast I do. to that. I'm on the email, so yep. that's just another form. Yeah. When you've got it in your pocket and the, your phone rings all the time, mm-hmm. it consumes you. Mm-hmm. So here's another simple step. Just turn off notifications, folks. You can check your phone at reasonable times during the day, right? You can go you know, from a meeting to lunch and check your phone. You don't need notifications on 24-7 pushing things at you. Here's the latest weather alert. Here's what your you know, mom just posted on Facebook. Here, you don't need that stuff. It's really quite like, simple. Going back to children, how in the world do you control that? Because mm-hmm. everybody they know is carrying a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Get them a flip phone. Don't give them a smartphone, folks. The technology actually is starting to swing the other direction. People are recognizing I think smart businessmen and entrepreneurs are recognizing there are parents that want an alternative route. And so there are phones that will give you access to some things, but not everything. Great idea. Right? It's brilliant. Okay? You can still get a hold of mom and dad, but you do not need access to the internet. 
and yet uh, the Apple 9, 10, 11 all get more complicated and offer you more things to mm-hmm. suck you in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I've got an ancient phone. Yeah. I won't give it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Apple's been pressured into, you know, the your screen time report now. Uh, due to pressure, they give you every week my – my iPhone gives me my screen time report to let me know, here's how you're doing. So here's one of the things we did. We actually developed an app because we know people live on their phones. This is it. I, I can't change the world in a snap of my fingers. So we developed an app called the One Minute Pause. It's free. I'm not making a nickel off of it. And it guides people through 60 seconds of prayer and turning their attention to God. How do they get it? Get on the App Store. It's for iPhones and Android. It's absolutely free. It's called One Minute Pause. And uh, we made the sponsor of it my ministry, so it's not even connected to me. It's Ransomed Heart as our ministry. So it's just One Minute Pause by Ransomed Heart. And it is this beautiful time of prayer of turning our attention to Jesus. John, where does this lead? If we go faster and faster and faster— is it like a an automobile engine where if you keep the pedal all the way to the floor, you'll eventually burn that engine out? Mm-hmm. Will there come a point of mass chaos if we don't get control of it? I don't think it will be chaos. I think it will be breakdown. I think human beings are finite. We were made immensely dependent by God. And I, I love this. You have to sleep every day. You have to drink water. You have to breathe air. All of our creation was intended to show us how dependent we are on our creator so that we would turn to him and walk with him. I think what's happening already, you know, in the incidences um, of depression and anxiety and the suicide rates, you're just watching humanity saying, I can't take it. I can't keep up. I just can't do it. And I actually think that's a good thing for people Mm. to get to the place that they say, I can't keep up. Think of Jesus as our model. Frequently, he left the crowds. He left his disciples. He went up into the hills to pray. Yeah. Uh, The first 40 days of his ministry were spent alone, absolutely alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, where he prayed and studied the Scripture. Mm-hmm. We don't know what else uh, he did out there, but uh, we do know that it shaped his entire ministry, and mm-hmm. Satan came after him mm-hmm. at that mm-hmm. time. Yeah. There's one illustration that means a lot to me. Jesus came down from the hill where he'd been praying, and he came to the seashore, and there were masses of people there to be healed. Mm-hmm. Who knows what diseases they had. Do you remember what he did? He walked past them and got in a boat and rowed off. Mm -hmm. All these people that need him, some were dying. Yes. He had had enough. He knew he had come to a point where he needed to regenerate and to be alone. Yes. I've thought a lot about that. Uh, There was the illustration, the uh, story of the woman who had an issue of blood, and Jesus was walking by, and she reached out and took hold of his garment, and he turned around and said, someone touched me, Mm. and he healed her. Mm. And then I realized that the reason he knew she had touched him is energy went out of his body. Yes, it cost him something to heal. Yes. Uh, we don't know the divine nature of that. Yeah. But you can imagine having people follow you all day, every day, begging for for healing. Mm. And he, had an, he, he knew that his body had to be maintained, mm-hmm. and he walked away from them. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard that illustration? Oh, I, lo- I love it. I love it. I use it in my book. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. And heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ knows what madness is like. I mean, there are thousands of people trying to get his attention, right? The constant crowds. It said at one point he could not go into the villages anymore. He had to sleep out in the woods. 
So he knows what it means to be hard pressed. And he says, come to me and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Since we read that there in the scriptures and we know it and believe it, God knows that we need rest too, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Many ministers absolutely break their health because they can't slow down. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Jones is always in the hospital. Mm -hmm. My dad did that at 39 years of age. He was an evangelist, and he did 20, 22 revivals per year. And he got so worn out and tired. You know, he, in those days, the evangelist lived with the pastor. Right. And he had kids who stood at the doorway while he was getting ready for bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, his, his life was really very difficult. And then he had to travel, and he traveled in a car. And at 39, his health broke. Mm -hmm. It was an emotional breakdown, but it was actually a neurological thing. Mm -hmm. It took him two years to get out of it. I've seen up close and personal what happens when you abuse a human body, even with good mm -hmm. things. Right, which is why chapter two in the book is called Benevolent Detachment, learning to let it go. All right, we get caught up in people's drama. We get caught up in the cultural drama. And at some point, we have to recognize we are not God. We can't save the world. We can't even carry it. And learning good people with tender hearts and good consciousness carrying way too much and learning to truly, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all their cares upon the Lord. Have you tried to do that, John? Every day. You have been a well-known speaker and writer, and there's no end to what you could be doing and people are calling you and asking you to come and speak and asking you to hold conferences. I know a little bit about that world because I've mm. been there. Right. Uh, have you ever just sat down with your wife and said, wait a minute, let's talk this thing through. Mm. This is not right. We're going too fast. We're working too hard. Let's see what we can change. Have you ever done that? Last May. <laughs> really? And we took June off and we said to our team, we're not well. We're actually burnt out, and we can't keep running at this pace. We, we've got to get away and rest and recover and realign. And then when we come back, we have to relook at our schedule because, again, I'm the one saying yes to most of this stuff. Yeah. Most of it is choices we can make. That's the hopeful part of this. Once you get it under control, guess what happens? It creeps up on you again. Mm -hmm, and you have to it? do it again yeah. and again and that's, again. That's right. We've been talking to John Eldridge, a New York Times bestselling author. His book is called Get Your Life Back. That's what we've been discussing, everyday practices for a world gone mad. John, this is good stuff. Thanks for being with us for two days. I love talking to you. Yeah. Let's do it again. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. God bless you, my friend. God bless you all here. Well, John Eldridge's story is a great reminder that we all can take control over our busy lives and elevate how we spend our time each and every day. By the way, if you missed any part of John Eldridge's conversation with Dr. Dobson over the past couple of days here on Family Talk, remember you can easily listen again simply by visiting our website, drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. And if you'd like to learn more about John Eldridge, his ministry, or his books like Wild at Heart, you can find more information on our website as well. Again, that's drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Easter, of course, is coming up this Sunday. What kind of memories do you have about celebrating Easter with your family? You know, it's always so important to share Jesus with your children, and what better time than the day of the Lord's resurrection, Easter Sunday? 
Now, if you'd like some great ideas about how to introduce your child to the Lord or how to encourage your kids to get closer to God in their relationship with Him, we have a helpful resource for you, and it's free. It's entitled, Share Jesus with Your Children. It's a PDF that you can download right from our website. All you have to do is sign up and have it sent right to your email box. To get yours, go to drjamesdobson.org. You'll see the Share Jesus with Your Children PDF link. Click right there on our homepage, and you'll be set. It's that easy. Also, I want to share with you a brand new resource from the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute that is designed to help reach the next generation for Christ. JDFI has remastered Dr. Dobson's biblically-based Transforming Truths into one-minute audio messages. Imagine how the new Dr. Dobson Minute will encourage young families and give them practical insights to strengthen marriages and foster better parenting skills. Nearly a thousand radio stations nationwide have picked up the Dr. Dobson Minute, and you need to find out what they're so excited about. So to listen in or to send one to a friend or family member, simply visit drdobsonminute.org. These are timeless messages indeed that the whole family will enjoy. Well, I'm Roger Marsh, thanking you for listening to Family Talk, the voice you trust for the family you love. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.